Okay, our facilitator instructor for the Veg Club is Carol Appenzeller. And Carol thinks about growing food more than most people should. That's to our benefit because she has a lot of knowledge that she's gonna share with us. She's been growing vegetables for three decades, half of that time spent on Bainbridge Island. She has the equivalent of 33 four by eight foot garden beds on her less than quarter acre lot, which is an inspiration for every vegetable gardener west of the Cascades. Please welcome Carol Appenzeller. Thank you, John, thank you. Thanks for taking care of all of everything technical ever having to do with this and also the good cheer. It's very sweet. And thanks everybody for coming. I'm so, I'm torn because I'm supposed to be looking at you, but then I'm looking over here at you. Um, I'm glad you're here. Let's see what happens when I share my screen. It actually works. That's looking the way I want it to. That first note is just in case someone didn't hear the announcement. <clears throat> and um, you can get a recording of the last month's class, which John, are you gonna post that? You're gonna put that in the chat if you wanna see last month's class. Uh, so you don't have to jot down this URL, which John already has, I assume. So we're going to talk about, what are we talking about? We're talking about succession planting, which we started last time, and lights, and um, protecting your plants all year round, and uh, repelling slugs. But first, I have a couple of announcements, because last time we were talking about opportunities to grow with other people who might know stuff that you would want to know. And one of the opportunities is Peaceful Morning Farm, John Chang, middle of the island here. Um, let's go there. There it is. The buildings aren't his because those are um, Brian McWhorter's buildings, but this is the Morales farm. And a lot of it is John Chang's um, peaceful morning farm. He grows 90% of the veg he grows, goes to food banks. 10% goes as little thank you gifts to people who help him. So you could go work with him. I talked to him, he's very into this. Um, he has people volunteer all the time. You can volunteer with him and pick his brain while you're planting lettuces. And the other one is um, the Farmers and Gardeners Guild. So look, they have chickens, they have, um, what else? They have ducks, they're thinking of milking goats, and they would like um, people to join who have all kinds of skills. It says all skills appreciated not just gardening knowledge. So that's the Farmers and Gardeners Guild. Both these links and all this information will be in the resource page. And John is also scrambling to put it in the chat, but you don't have to copy it out of the chat if you're feeling stressed about it because it's on the resource page that you're gonna get at the end. I don't, um, I've talked to Heidi a few times. I've never been to this Farmers and Gardeners Guild, but, I, but you can call her and ask her about it. Okay. So by the end of our meeting, I think you're going to be able to do all of these things. I think you're going to overlap crops, set up simple lights if you want to this year or next. But this is just to build your knowledge as a gardener, not you know, to tell you you have to do it this year. But you're going to keep accumulating knowledge. And someday you might say, that's a good idea. I'm going to do it. You're going to reduce plant stress when you move starts outside and build simple, movable row covers that I use every season and also fight slugs. So first I'm gonna do a little tiny review of what we did last time, which is planting in succession. So you can see the different parts of the growing season in this picture. And one, one plant starts bolting, but you're ready because you're either gonna put seed in before that plant is done, before it's ripe, you're gonna slightly overlap. And if you put seed in, that's convenient, but it can be too cold, too hot, too slug ridden, too wet, something like that. So you might want to start those ahead of time. And if you do, you end up overlapping your planting by two to three weeks with like uh, these guys. So those are like two week old lettuces and they're going to go out tomorrow. Um, so if you did this just three times for three crops, not even like all your crops in all your beds four times, that's 
that's and you did it you overlapped by three weeks that's nine weeks of like plant weeks right plant growth yeah. so that's pretty cool and you can start them even during the warm season you don't have to only start them when it's cold too cold out so we talked last time about same crop sowings where you plant if you say I need three lettuces a week, so every other week I'm gonna plant six or every month I'm planting 12 because I can't be bothered every other week, something like that. So it's good for lettuce and cilantro and lots of quick growth things. And then different crops in a sequence. That's pretty much the previous page we just saw. And then different maturity crops. So that's when I have a giant pumpkin that I love to grow the sweet meat pumpkins. They're a squash basically, but they need a four by four foot root space eventually but not when they're tiny. So I have lettuce starts ready to go and I put the lettuce starts all around. By the time the pumpkin takes over, the lettuce is mature and it's enjoying the shade from the pumpkin. So pretty good. Um, so those are all kinds of succession that we talked about last time. If you want some more details, um, well, here are some more details. What can you sow directly in the garden or what do we sow in, directly in the garden instead of in cells? So here we go, directly in the ground. These are very rootsy things, see these? They wanna put their roots straight down so we don't put them in cells because it kind of messes them up. Oh, cells are these little pots. I call cells anything that you're growing in. So these are like classically what cells are. You know, you get them from the, you get them from the nursery, but I would say any little pot I'm gonna call a cell. So we don't do those, put those right in the ground. Don't worry about it. These second group are a little easier in the ground, but I, everybody you talk to will have a different take on this. Some people always start their peas in, in cells. I have started corn and I always start my cukes in cells. And I think beets are really easy in cells, but um, you know, people are sort of divided about that. So if you have any specific questions about that, I like to get ahead of the warm season by starting cukes in a in cells. <clears throat> and these, if you just are starting out this third category, these are really happy in cells. See, they're really leafy. What you want to be aware of is, is it the if I'm you're going to start them in cells outside, are the temperatures right for them? So you want to look on the packet, or you want to go to um, your favorite seed source and look up when you know what's the germination temperature for lettuce when does it like to grow because for example basil is on here and basil doesn't want to grow um, outside like on your patio in cells until it's quite warm and then this next category is great for in cells in fact we have to grow them that way here because they need a super long warm season but we don't have it so we have to fake it for the first several weeks of their lives. Like lettuce takes two weeks to grow in cells probably, but a tomato takes forever and you, you keep potting them up into bigger and bigger pots. So if you wanna go for um, a particular variety of tomato or pepper that you really love from your childhood or something, um, that's a good way to go. But you don't have to, it's perfectly respectable to go buy starts from, from the nursery or something. This last category needs cool temperatures. So they start in the house really well. They love the 68 degrees to germinate, but then they wanna get cooled off to 60, 65 degrees pretty quick. So I don't have those in my house temps right now, um, but you can start them outside later when things warm up a little bit. Um, but you could also do them, if you're gonna to try to do them now, you could do them on, if you have lights, if you wanna get lights. You can start them at 68 and then put them in that cold room that you have, that, that um, the garage or whatever, depending on your temps. So let's see, what do we grow them in? Well, on the far right, there are the cells that you can put them in lots of containers that you don't have to make more plastic, right? Um, I'm gonna just recommend you not do that and crowd them in like that just for now, if you're new to this because you have to get these out of there speedy quick and put them into little cups by themselves anyway. But this one on the top left, um, I would like to advocate. You can put them in the cups. You can put them in individual egg carton cells, cut off juice bottles. Um, this one I'll explain a little bit. This person is gonna thin it to four plants, one in each quadrant. 
And then before they plant them out, like maybe a week before they plant them out, they're going to cut with a knife between them in the, the soil, between them like that way and that way. So that you then have these four separated plants. It seems cruel, but it's kinder than like trying to pull them out and rip them. And do you see that there, uh, one thing I disagree with that picture is, do you see how little soil there is in that, pit, in that container? That, that's kind of a waste of container, right? So soil, when you put your soil, your seeding mix in any mix, you know, it compacts down as you water it as like time goes by. So you might want to put it in and press it down a little bit and water it and then think, could, could I fit a little bit more in there? You want a little rim to hold water, right? But you don't want like that much. And um, we're looking at seedling mix that is sterile. People do mix their own seedling mix. I do, my neighbor does, um, but if you're starting out, you want to get yourself some, some um, sterile seed mix because then it doesn't have anything that will rot those babies that you're trying to grow. And so plants that don't need a long warm season, like not tomatoes, can be planted out throughout the spring and summer as long as you can check on the germination temperatures to make sure that they're going to be happy. Like I wouldn't plant basil in April because basil likes it to be like 80. So how can you find out what germination temps are and what, what a plant needs? You can go to, for example, Johnny's. So we're looking at the spinach seed and we go down here and this shows temperatures. And this shows how like how successful it will be at uh, germinating. So you can see that spinach, spinach actually doesn't mind germinating at super cold temps, but it takes a really long time. And then you get to about 68 and it starts to tank. It doesn't want to be above 68. So do you all, has anybody tried growing spinach in August because you decided to have fall spinach? I'm not seeing anybody. Um, well, you'll plant a hundred plants and like 40 of them come up maybe because it, it hates the heat. It doesn't want to germinate. It has an, a genetic adaptation not to germinate in the heat. So this happens to be Johnny's. So it's handy and they have like growth and growing information, things like that. So that is one of the places you can look up. You can look these things up. You can cover them up with a cloche like this, which in this case, a cloche to me is anything that you're protecting plants with. But this is a drawer, I hope, from a broken set of drawers. And they vented it by tipping it up. You can also poke holes in the sides, big holes. And But I wouldn't put it on the ground like this because slugs. And these will keep, uh, you know, keep it out of the wind and increase the temperatures a little bit. Oh, window light, sad news. Does anybody have starts that you've grown in the window and they were just great and they didn't get all skinny? Like eight inches of stem, two leaves, eight inches of stem, two leaves. Remember the bean plant from kindergarten? Well, windows generally don't work, even if it's bright because not everything passes through that window and it, they often have coatings on them that don't make it don't, not work. But you can grow them under lights and get a head start. Does anybody have any questions? I got to look. I'm not looking. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything. Do you, John? Do you see questions? Nothing yet. If you have a question and you don't want to type it, you can just, I don't know, holler at us. Okay. All right. Oh, a few more tips. Um, you can fill the cells a little bit and then sprinkle, just a little sprinkle of whatever you're using organic fertilizer in your garden. So like down to earth is one brand. It's sold locally. There's also one called Dr. Earth, but I happen to use down to earth now. And sprinkle it on like, like you put salt on or like heavy salt, maybe you don't, it doesn't need much. Um, if it's a really quick growing plant, like lettuce, it's possible it doesn't even need it, but I'm telling you, you know, in case you want to put a little bit of fertilizer in there, it's good insurance. 
if you do keep your starts in cells for many weeks, like you want to grow peppers, so you're keeping them, you're going to have to put fertilizer in there or fertilize them with, I'd start with like a quarter strength fertilizer, but you don't do it right away. You let them get like several sets of real leaves and keep an eye on them. If they seem to stop or turn slightly yellow or something, if they stop growing, then then you can always do that because there isn't much nutrient in the sterile seed starting mix. Um, and do you know what cotyledons are? Cotyledons are the first leaves. They look different from the rest of the plant's leaves. They're called the seed leaves. Um, they just, they do yellow. They're meant to be temporary. So if you have plenty of other leaves growing, don't worry about the seed leaves withering or going yellow or falling off or whatever, because that's what they do. And you can seed your tomatoes and peppers if you're at that level. That's kind of a, that's a, not a thing if you're a very beginner, but if you're ready to do lights and tomatoes and things like that, then you can seed them about mid-March. And this is what potting up looks like. If you have to pot up a transplant, you've taken it out. This is actually a little root bound, but they're putting it into a bigger pot with more seeding medium and a little bit of fertilizer maybe. So that's potting up. And when do we do that? So check this out. This is the just right picture. This plant has used all the soil for its roots. It's gone to the bottom of the pot, but it's not circling all the way around. And the reason we want it to have used the soil is that if you take it out when it's like this, there are no roots here and there are hardly any roots here. And when you go to turn it over and put it in a pot or put it in the ground in your garden, that soil is going to fall off. And then the roots are like, don't know where to go. It's not very stable for the roots. Also, it's a little bit of a waste of this soil because the roots never got there to use it. So the just right, the Goldilocks picture's in the middle. You could even have more roots on this side here. And then root bound is on the right side. That's too much. That, that wanted to get out a couple of weeks prior to this picture. So do you have any questions or contradictions? Like I, always let my plants get root bound. It's the very best thing to do. Okay. I really felt like it was a monologue last time. It was a monologue last time. So any, any more interaction that I can get, I'm glad to hear it. Cause I'm a, actually have, I'm a classroom teacher and Zoom is funny cause it's just one person that's talking. Okay. So that's, I have these interspersed just to see if anybody will will talk to me. Oh, got three questions in chat. I see it. I see it already. Okay. I'm going. Jerry wants, says, when do you recommend starting green beans? Um, the soil needs to be warm. So it depends on your garden. Um, but I would do it in late May, early June, maybe. Um, and I might, if I were really eager, take a piece of discarded plastic plastic and put it over my bed that I'm going to put my green beans in. So I might like amend that bed and do everything I get it ready and then put that plastic over, kind of warm it up. But you know, we have from the previous class and in the resource page that you're going to get at the end, we have, I have, um, I have one particular, um, what is it, planting calendar that I really like. It's called West Side Gardener. And he will say, plant now, plant now, plant now. So that will, I think that will help you out. Um, root bound starts. Well, it kind of depends on the start. So Peter asked, what are my recommendations for root bound starts? I would try to gently tease the roots out. You just need to get the tips of the roots coming out from the root ball. Some people will tear the root ball because that stimulates growth of more roots. If it's really pot bound, like really tight, I will sometimes do that or I'll score the outside of the ball, root ball. I've seen research that says it's not, it doesn't really help to do that very much. It doesn't make the plant grow any faster, but it does make the plant not just continue to circle, you know, or continue in that root bound spot. 
in state. So my recommendations. Peter, did that do it? Or do you have something else to ask about that? Try to disturb the roots a little bit. Um, but if you can avoid them, if you can, okay, if you can actually, you can do this at the store, take the plant that you're curious about, look at the bottom, if roots are coming out the bottom, maybe you wanna put your fingers around the plant. So there's the plant, go like that, turn the pot upside down, take the pot off and look. And um, things like cucumbers do not wanna be pot bound at all because they have brittle roots, but, um, I would probably buy, I might buy a root bound lettuces and just disturb the roots and try to see if they'll recover. They often do. Let's see, when I buy starts and nurseries, the plants are often not root, not root bound when I plant them. No, no, they shouldn't. Maybe I wasn't clear about that. This, um, so Jill asks, should I wait until they're root bound? Um, Jill, this would be ideal right here. So this is not root bound. The one on the right is root bound and that's a bit late. But I, this is great, this is ideal. This one, yeah, they do sometimes take teeny tiny starts and put them in a bigger pot and then up the price. <laughs> that's a little cynical, but sometimes, but I suppose what they're doing is saving the plants and then allowing them to grow into the bigger pot. Um, I think in that case, because they've probably been potted up, if you lost soil, it wouldn't hurt the root ball because there is probably inside of that a root ball that is stable from, you know, it's like a tiny root ball. So if it's working for you, that's fine. It's just, this is a little bit hard to work with and unstable because you can get it in the ground, but it's gonna, um, it's gonna kind of fall apart, right? So does that mean I should move them? Oh, yep, okay. I think we're good. Let me know, John, if any more of them show up. Thank you, thank you, questions, question people. Okay, let's look at lights because we're educating you. You could get lights right now. You can, of course, start crops earlier and growing your own tomatoes, but we also use them to grow basil and cilantro all winter. So you know how you get the bunch and then half of it rots in the fridge? You can have basil and cilantro in little bits at a time. These are baby basils. These are not the winter basils, but teeny tiny basils right there under the lights. Yeah, so, okay, so we'll have some tips on lights. There's a lot of stuff on lights. You know, shop lights are great. So from the hardware store, Craigslist, the garage sale, the picture on the right was free stuff from a few weeks ago on Craigslist in Kitsap County. There are tons of them in Seattle and they show up here and they should have two tubes. So see, they each have two tubes and then they have a white reflector. I have some that don't have a reflector and they work fine, but it's better if they do. And the reason we want two tubes is um, we want tubes above all the leaves. So I don't wanna have these guys growing and then one tube that's down the middle because we need a lot of light on these guys. These guys need lights right above them. So I even like two lights with two tubes each. Okay, so it says one warm and one cool tube. So that's like a pinkish glow and a, um, a bluish glow, a blue white light. And um, a lot of places will say you should get one warm and one cool tube. But what if you get them already filled, like you get them for free on Craigslist or you buy them that way? Um, it still works. Those work really well. I have found broad spectrum shop light tubes, as long as they are broad, broad spectrum, just like they're not special plant light full spectrum, they're just broad spectrum. You can use either broad spectrum or you can use one warm, one cool. So here's my defense of the broad spectrum bulbs. I got some from the thrift store and I used the tubes that were already in there for 10 years and the plants grew great. And then they conked up. So I got one warm and one cool and the plants are exactly the same. So then I thought, well, that's just me. We need more data. Well, Carol Deppie, who grows, um, 
she's a plant breeder for the Northwest. She wrote in one of her books, I grow all my starts under two lights that I bought at the thrift store and I'm using the original tubes. So it was exactly what I do. And then Kansas State, I mean, I'm sure it's a lot of Aggies, but Kansas State University said, you don't need the warm and cool. So if you were buying them new, I'd probably go warm and cool because I don't want to like mess you up. But if they're already in there, you might just try growing the plants under and see how it goes. So those are some tips and more, more tips. Okay, for fluorescence, you're gonna see people say, keep the lights three to five inches away from the plant. Nope, there isn't that much light coming out of fluorescence. It's not the sun. So we want it one inch to less than an inch above the, the plant. So that means if the plants are this big, the lights are like right there. And, um, oh yeah, they'll say adjust for plant height. So the second thing here, so you wanna have the lights on pulleys and they go up and down. Well, it's really good to have them adjustable height-wise, but what do you do when you have a six inch plant and a one inch plant? You move the plants. So uh, especially for home growers, we're not have, we don't have 300 tomato plants. We have like the big tomato plants and the teeny tiny basils that just got started. So in the picture on the right, you can see that this is actually on a shelf but this wood is an off cut chunk of wood. On the far right, it's propped up on a turned over like takeout container or something. And then there are some books that I don't really like. So these are my starts. And as they get bigger, I pull out chemistry for dummies. And when I wanna do something else, I, you know, when, it, when these get bigger, I pull out the takeout container. And so all kinds of things. Sometimes I'll take a baking pan from the kitchen and shove it under, cause I don't really wanna use things for one thing. I wanna use what I have. And then another thing is we have to keep the lights on for longer because plants need a certain number of photons. They need their photons bucket filled up. And uh, because nothing is as strong as the sun, we have to leave the lights on for longer um, in order to fill that bucket up. And yeah, you wanna keep fluorescent tubes up out of the kids reach because they do require special disposal, right? They've got some mercury in them. Um, so you don't want them smashing anything. I'm going to show you why you want the plant, the light close, drop some science on you. So here's light. This is a point source light, but it works with tubes too. If you really think about it, I could explain. So my plant's going to be one inches away, one inch away, and the light coming out spreads and it covers that area. But then you say, no, I'm going to put mine at two inches away. And you'd think it like, it doesn't look different to me, right? It looks like the same brightness when I hold my hand up there but it's called the inverse square law. If you move it twice as far, it's one quarter the intensity because that same amount of light is spread over four inches, four square inches. And then three, it goes to spread over nine inches. So it's a lot less bright. And I do see questions. I'm gonna answer at the end of this. Um, you can get LEDs also. They come two ways. So on the right, you see a pinkish glow. That's a red blue light because plants, you'd think plants use green light because they're green, right? But the reason you see them as green is they're not using the green light. It's bouncing off and hitting your eyes. What they suck in and use to build sugar is, is um, red and blue light. And uh, the white one is fine. That is actually a plant light. All also, so both of those are specific LEDs for plants, but the broad spectrum one, the white one has all the colors. So it's got red and blue. And of course the red blue light people who make the purpley glow lights that you see there um, say that there's more efficient because they're using all their energy to make what the plants want. But um, um, the, Aggie, the ag reports say that they both work. And you can even get them as tubes. You have to read but there are some that are tube shaped and they can go in actual fluorescent lights. So um, you have to check and make sure that they're the right size and the right wattage and stuff, wattage equivalency. Um, oh yeah, and with LEDs, you keep the plants further from the light and you're gonna have to adjust it as needed. And I'm sorry, I can't tell you how many inches because LEDs, especially now, cause it's kind of the wild west and everybody's making new kinds of you know, plant lights and things, because it's a fairly new technology. You kind of have to read the package 
and then do some experimentation. So if you decide five inches is your distance and the plants go crisp, then you're gonna move the plants, you're gonna move the light away. And if they start to get leggy and skinny, then you're gonna move the light closer. So leggy is, yeah, long stem and then in between the leaves. And there are three links on the resources page, I think under this. So it'll give you varying degrees of information about LED lights, depending on how far you want to dive in. Oh yeah, and the last thing on here says, do the reviews mention vegetable starts? And the reason I say this is a lot of LED talk is about growing marijuana. And is it the right light way, uh, wavelength for making them bud? But budding takes different wavelengths from um, just growing babies. So yeah. And you can pay so much money for special racks with lights on them. And often the lights are not even intense. They'll be like one tube over this massive shelf. And so the pictures do not, do not uh, show me that they're gonna work very well. So you can have it in a bookcase under a shelf. So, you know, the picture on the lower right is my actual grow lights that are in a bookcase. So the lights are chained from cup hooks on one shelf and then the plants are on the shelf below and then there are books below that and family heirlooms above. So uh, you can do it. Put it, you know, if you don't want it in the living room, put it in the office. You can put it of course on your garage shelves or your workbench if you're growing brassicas for cool temperatures or you can make yourself a homemade light stand, both of which are shown on the right side, far right is wood like that because that's just gonna compost when you're done with it. The left side, is PVC, you don't glue it together because it will stay together, but, and you can pull it apart when you want to store it. It does make plastic, PVC is fairly polluting when you make it. One thing I would do with this one is I would move these two light stands closer because see how far apart these lights are? They're also way too high. I would want them to have two tubes and be close together so I can get them and down, have the plants lifted quite high so that they're really, get an exposure. Okay, let's see, I'm gonna go. Yeah, I think I'll check for these for questions. So do I need full spectrum bulbs? I don't think you need a special plant light, but you need if you're going to use um, just an office light. And if it says full spectrum on it or broad spectrum, that's fine or you can do one pink, one blue, um, one warm, one cold. That says, let's see, hi Fran Corton. Fran bought spinach, lettuce, and peas. There were many separate roots in each cell. Gently pulled them apart. Yeah, especially with spinach and lettuce, you can, you can pull them apart. Yeah, if you're gentle, yeah, that's actually called pricking out. You can just use, your fingers, when you do that, you wanna grab the leaves, not the stems, because they can replace a leaf, but a plant can't replace the stem. And um, yeah, you can even use like a pencil to kind of pull them apart. I don't know if the peas will respond well to that, but I'm looking forward to you telling me, Fran, if the peas were okay with that. Sometimes their roots are kind of brittle and stuff, but yeah. Um, are fluorescent bulbs better than LED? Oh, LED produces more photosynthetically active radiation. So it's called a PAR rating. So are they better? Um, the LEDs are more efficient. So they're less cost per hour to run, but you might not notice it very much. It might not make a very big difference. Um, but if you wanna save energy, that might, you know, it's a virtuous way to go. And um, they may be more expensive. I would really look at the reviews because there are lots of different kinds for some that people like. And the LEDs don't have any mercury in the tubes. And um, I did hear a discussion that, you know, making LEDs is not pollution-free either, but um, those are some advantages. 
I don't know if fluorescent bulbs are better, but if you already had fluorescent bulbs, I wouldn't necessarily want you to scrap them. Um, oh, this says we get even better results with LED. That's cool. I'm looking for a rationalization for getting LED, but I have to let mine grow, uh, wear out first. So that's Stephen Beverly. You like your LED. I'd like to hear about that. And there you go. Okay, so I think that's it, right, John? I don't see any more. Okay, so sometimes when you grow things inside under light, something called damping off happens. And that's when on Tuesday, they're all like this. And on Wednesday, they're like that. And their little stems have rotted. So if it happens, get the, damp the ones that have fallen over. I mean, get the whole container containing those out. Um, you can, if it didn't happen to the, their neighbors in other containers, that's okay. But get it out, dump the soil, get rid of the starts, soak, wash them out, soak them in bleach, and then rinse it a whole lot. And you start over with sterile seed starting mix. And you know those, there are seed starting kits that have this plastic cover, looks like a, looks like a takeout container cover. Um, I know, I'd never use those. Uh, I use a little like a plastic bag over lettuce starts because I don't put them in the soil. I just press them onto the surface of the soil and they can dry out easily. But um, if you did have a humidity cover on, as soon as any seed under there sprouts, I would pull it off. And with the humidity cover, if you're using it over the whole bunch of seeds and one seed takes five weeks to sprout and one seed takes two days, I don't think it does very much good because you're taking it off, um, off too early for some of the seeds but you can partially cover things with like a loose open bread bag or something. You know those bread bags that um, they're plastic but they have teeny tiny holes in them and they're really crinkly. They come sometimes inside of a paper sack. Um, those are really good. And if it's still a problem, if you have a little fan, you can blow. Ah, and here we have, Gabby says, use 50-50 vinegar water instead of, oh, can I sterilize? Okay, so I have heard that it doesn't work for that, but um, I haven't really looked up all the details on that. Even Anne Lovejoy says use the bleach, but I could definitely, you know, why not? I guess straight vinegar is too, too, um, too much vinegar, I guess, too expensive maybe. Um, yeah, so I don't know about 50-50 vinegar. Does anybody else? You can post if you do. Okay, you're gonna have to break it to them. They need to move out of your house. Whoa. So we're gonna do this when they have three or four leaves, true leaves, not the cotyledons, but real leaves. And the week before we're gonna put them outside or start to put them outside, we're gonna reduce the water. Not, you know, don't starve them, but you're just gonna get rid of, you're just gonna not give them quite as much. You're gonna let the surface dry out a little bit. And you're going to stop fertilizer if you're using it. That's for the week before. And then you're going to set them outside for one or two hours. If it's blastingly sunny, you need a little bit of shade. So you can go over to your house. And you know those windows that have screens on them, but you never use them? You never open that window for some reason? You can take the screen off and you can prop it over your starts. Or you can come up with some other kind of screen. Or you can put it behind a plant that gently filters the light, but we need sun on those things because we have to get them used to it. Or they'll get sunburn. They'll get sunburn if they get too much sun. And that's when you get a little area that looks like a paper bag. I don't have any sunburn on this, um, on the leaf. And it's, it's okay. If the leaf gets a little bit sunburned, it's not a huge deal. And then every day you're gonna give them a little bit more, like an hour more a day, or maybe two hours a day. And keep them up off the ground because slugs, and if you, they need to be a little bit warmer because it's been warm in your house and you're trying to get them used to a little bit cooler outside, then you can use that cloche again. Okay. Let's see. But the slugs are still gonna try to get them. So I thought I would do some slugs, slug stuff. And maybe you can um, type in your slug ideas right now too. Big starts, I love the big starts because the slugs can't eat them as easily. 
often they're also up higher so the slugs doesn't occur to them. And of course, grow them up off the ground. So a crate, a table, but not, I wouldn't invert pots and I wouldn't put them on bricks and I wouldn't put them on a pallet like on the ground because that is a slug hotel under there. And then they'll just come up at night and munch away. Um, oh, beer traps. Does anybody hate beer traps? I'm looking at you. Oh, I see somebody nodding. It's because you hate beer traps. I like beer traps. I have seen some YouTube videos that say the slugs just come and drink and then they leave. Mine don't, they are in there. They are some dead slugs and a lot of them. So I'll just tell you how to do this. So you see, oh, I smeared it. See there's a, this is a yogurt tub and you're gonna need a lid because we wanna keep the water out. We wanna keep the rain out and you're gonna cut a window. And in fact, two windows, one on each side. And see how high that window is? It's kind of hard to see, huh? This is actually about less than two inches across and maybe an inch and a half high. But see that it's pretty close to the rim? We want a lot of space down here. We're gonna fill it up with, we're gonna cut this with like a, you know, a box knife very carefully and then the scissors so you don't slip and cut your hand. And then we're gonna fill it up with beer or an alternative, which I'll show in a minute. Maybe an inch, inch and a half. I think three quarters of a beer is what I put in one of them. And then I'm gonna bury it. So I'm gonna bury it I'll make a little hole in the ground and I'm gonna bury it up to here just for a little bit of stability so it doesn't get knocked over quite as easy. But I don't wanna bury it all the way up to the window because tiny bugs. We don't wanna catch the tiny bugs. So we want this wall. So here's the soil and here's where the slugs have to go. And they go up and they go down into the beer and they have a lovely time, but they fail to drink responsibly and it's not my fault. And those bugs are actually slug eating beetles. So we do not want them in there. So they won't go up and over. So that's the deal with the slug trap. Let's see, does anybody have any slug trap info? Nope. Um, I said last time I don't mulch little seedlings in the rainy season because I don't want leaf mulch slug bedrooms all around my lettuces because I think they it invites the slugs. And certainly when it gets warmer, then I do mulch. Um, I, oh, the next one says water in the morning. There's some ag research that compared watering in the morning rather than at night to slug pellets, the old style slug pellets, and they were equally effective. So, I mean, even if they're like three quarters as effective, I think that's pretty good. I think watering in the morning, letting the surfaces dry out is a great way not to invite as many slugs. And then copper tape. I know copper tape is beloved of many people, beloved by many people, I guess, but um, Kew Gardens and a few other places have done some studies like real, controlled studies and they say that it doesn't really work. But I'd be interested to know if you have a controlled study that's like two pots, same condition, same plant, same pot, one with one with copper and one without. Um, and you can plant cover to encourage predatory insects. So many insects in your garden are helping you. So don't panic when you see beetles and stuff because a lot of times those eat um, slug eggs. A lot of them do. So I think next time is when we're going to do some beneficial insect stuff. But um, maybe you've noticed this. You go to pull something out, you go to pull out chickweed or something, and there are bugs just crawling away. So some of those are predatory bugs. And so I have a lot of alyssum in my garden um, because it's really good cover for those bugs. And there are other plants too that you can use. And then the last one is just about, you know, when you're despairing and you can't get the slug, shall we call it waste, off of the lettuce, just put it in a pot of water for 10 minutes and it will rinse off if you have. And, you know, the, another thing is slugs are not a personal statement that you are not competent enough to be an adult. It's like dandelions in the lawn. They're not out to, you know, make, make you feel bad. They're just part of the ecosystem. So they are natural. Um, I'm not saying we should love them, 
but they also aren't a sign that you're a failure. Slug damage, slug holes is not that bad for, you know, a big cabbage plant with five slug holes in it is not really going to be damaged to an extent. And if you don't want to do beer, do this and love Joy's recipe. So that recipe is in the, it's in the resources page. And I haven't used it, but I don't know why, because why buy beer when you could do this? So I'm going to give it a go. Maybe you could test. Did I say, oh yeah, look, one of the questions here from, I don't see it now. I just can't remember. I don't see who it was. But anyway, thank you for asking about um, Sluggo, the iron phosphate. Um, what first they said iron phosphate is harmless and it was tested and they tested who the testing bodies tested iron phosphate and sure enough it doesn't kill anything but there is an inactive ingredient that makes the iron phosphate um, flood into the body all at once so that it is toxic and so it does that in slugs but it also does in earthworms and that's report that there have been pet poisonings so i wouldn't say that it's great for soil life um yeah so that is my answer for Sluggo. Yes, there will be a replay. There is a, um, there's a recording and John will provide that. Oh, how many beer traps per square foot? Okay. So I don't have enough, but um, you know, if one every three feet would probably be good. They, they are good for about like two to maybe two feet. They, they attract the, the slugs. So if you have lettuce, I do put them right in the middle, but a lot of people say, don't put them in the middle of the lettuce, put them around like slightly outside the lettuce bed to draw the slugs away. Oh, and another thing about slug traps is I think they're really great at this time of year because, and even earlier, because the slugs are waking up and they want to eat, but there's nothing out there. So when I put slug traps out, then they are very attracted. Let's see, a friend of mine swears by diatomaceous earth. That's good. I don't think it works unless it's dry. And I've seen some research that says they just go right over it. Also, um, I do use diatomaceous earth to keep them and earwigs and stuff out of the middle of my celery. I just put a little bit inside the celery and the um, aphids and stuff. Diatomaceous earth is a mechanical, it, it breaks the um, exoskeleton of crunchy bodied bugs. I'm not sure what it does to slugs. I guess maybe it's irritating. Um, but it does that to all insects. So I don't put it all over my garden. I'm really judicious about where I put it. So basically just inside the celery. Let's see. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome, Nathan. Thank you. And how often? Oh, I was thinking about this. I knew you'd ask me this. I don't do it often enough. Let's say I would top it up. Could you top it up once a week? Is that too much? Um, and supposedly as the slugs rot, the other slugs are, are interested and they go in there. But um, I probably should do it every week, but I don't. I probably do it every two weeks. Okay, back to alternatives. And we've got lots of questions and I think that's, every question okay oh this is my little spiel that i just said okay so that sounds a little scoldy i guess but i'm trying to just encourage you they're just part of the deal okay all right well um should we have a little break John, a little break, five minutes. Should we have five? So I'll see you back here in five minutes, okay? So two minutes after, that says, my, my clock says two, uh, it says it's three of, so I'll see you at two after. Okay, bye-bye. If you like me. Oh, shoot, that was part, that was part of when we weren't recording. Sorry, John. Did everybody see, did anybody who wanted to see the slug traps see the slug traps? Because I was, before I wasn't, I was screen sharing and I shouldn't have been. So the point is that you have a 
barrier, a wall, part of the wall sticking up out of the soil. So the beetles walking around hit um, the wall and go around and the slugs are more motivated and they go right, right up. It says, Steve and Beverly wanna know, what do I do to maintain the slug trap? I take up the lid and I often pour the slugs at the base of some plant that I wanna fertilize because that's a lot of nitrogen. And then that plant grows really well. And then I pour some more beer in and I slam the lid on it and put it back in the hole. Okay, that's how I do it. Is that it? And Mary Lou says, my experience, you're, I know you can read these, but um, only the black and brown slugs are attracted to the beer. Yeah, I never get banana slugs. The banana slugs are indigenous and good for a garden. Yeah, don't they eat the little slugs sometimes? I mean, they'll eat, they say they'll eat part of your plants, but they'll also eat, eat bugs, that, uh, in slugs that you don't want around. That's cool. And that's what I want. Okay, cleansing breath, everyone. We're going to talk about cloches and covers. So you might not do lights this year. You might never do lights, but now you know some stuff about them and about generally taking care of starts. Because even if you buy starts from the store, if they were in a greenhouse, they may not be hardened off. And that getting them used to moving out into the the world is called hardening off. So if you um, know that they came from a greenhouse, you might want to do that process that I said, where you give them some filtered light for an hour, and then you give them an hour a day more until they get used to the temperatures outside. So that works for purchase starts too. And another thing we can do with purchase starts and direct seeded things and all kinds of stuff that doesn't, doesn't refer to lights, is use cloches and tunnels. So a cloche, I said for me, is anything you turn upside down to put over a plant to protect it. So they can do all these things. So sure, protect your early season seedlings. Even if you're direct seeding into a bed, you can make a little friendly microclimate in there and harden off your starts. But you can also make your heat webbing plants that you bought from the store or grew yourself really happy I left, you know, last year with those 100 degree heat, I left the cloches on the tomatoes and or on the peppers and the eggplants and they loved it, just huge production. I did take it off like from 12 to two in the afternoon because why not expose them to that full sun? But um, I did have them on, it was really nice. So I'm gonna sh show you how to make some of those. Um, and you can also give plants a little more time to ripen in the fall. But I would say, when I say that, I would not, if you're, if you're thinking, I really wish my peppers got ripe, probably it's not the fall application of the cloche or the tunnel. It's really this one, um, putting it on and, and giving them a warm environment that's warmer than our usual 70 degrees um, to help them move their, their ripening along the way they want to in the year and you know all summer. You can keep rain off rot prone stuff. So I do a lot of that. A lot of things will stay in your winter garden for you that you can grow, but um, rot, uh, it doesn't, they don't freeze necessarily most of the time, but they, um, they will rot in the, in the rain. So that's handy and you can prevent freezing of winter crops. So, so here are some cloches. There's a lot going on in this picture. But this is super early autumn. I don't remember why I put them on so early, but this was a few years ago. I guess it, I wouldn't, I never do every, anything before I have to. So maybe it was gonna freeze hard. But here are some covers. And these are old refrigerator drawers. When our fridge finally broke for good, I just took it apart and used all the pieces I could. So underneath here is lettuce, spinach, bok choy, and green onions for winter. And under here is escarole, which is the top picture on the right. It looks like lettuce, holds up better in the winter. The slugs will live like under it and around it and maybe even in it, but they don't completely turn it into mush the way they sometimes do with winter lettuce. And um, yeah, if it gets really cold, I'll pick these up and maybe throw, you know, the 
the towels we use to dry off the kayak. And I'll just throw the towels on under here if it's going to go into the 20s and then put the cloches back on the tunnels. These are called low tunnels, really. Um, and I have food all winter. I mean, a lot of food all winter. So see this? Every lump is food. And here are the tunnels. This is another year, actually, but and there's just tons of food. This is an overturned, broken, Rubbermaid bin. And there's a cloche back there. And these are broccolis and cauliflowers that are going to make heads in March and April. And th that all stayed, stayed alive. So these are powerful in all seasons. So usually we make them like this, this picture on the left. We drive rebar in the ground, or we put little clips in the ground or something, and then we take plastic plumbing pipe, black plastic plumbing pipe. Some people use PVC that breaks down in the sun. I'm not sure what the black plastic plumbing pipe does in the sun, but you stretch them over and you make a little arch and then you stretch plastic over the top and then you tie the ends down like this over here. But, um, just a sec. But I actually am a fan of a slightly different way to go. So these are the very common ones, and you can find out all over the place how to make these if you decide these are your favorites. I'm gonna propose this one. I'm gonna talk this one up because I just have, uh, I don't see it as much and I really like it. So this is remesh, it's called remesh. It's concrete reinforcing mesh. So that's what that's called. It's not a hog panel. Hog panels cost 50 bucks. These cost 10. If you call Builders First Source, when I called them, I said, how much is remesh? And they said, hog panels are, and they told me the price for that because they figured I wanted it for my garden. I wanted a hog panel, but the hog panel is really rigid. And this is also not fencing because fencing is too smushy. So um, you can make an arch, you bend it so that it stays this way. It's not like spring loaded. When you pick it up, it doesn't go flat. And then you put a cover over it. And usually people pin the ends down, but I got tired of pinning the ends down because I eat my food that's out in the garden all year, or I'm trying to check on my starts at this time of year that, that are out there. And it means in order to push the side up, I have to unpin the ends and then kind of wrestle this and I'm cold and the water's caught in there and it's wet and it's kind of unpleasant. Um, so it's not terrible, but I do it a slightly different way. So I'll show you what I do. This is a short version of the same tunnel. So I cut a piece of plastic so that it can go all the way down on each end. So longer than the tunnel. And then I flatten it on the end. You can't really see, but I'm just trying to make it as flat as possible. And that leaves me with a lot of extra on the side. So I pick up the side and I shove my hand under and I work it in there, kind of like a modified hospital corner on a bed, because you can see it right here on the right side. And then I make a loop in a little bit of rope or paracord or whatever. And I hook it on the, I hooked it on the other side, but I hooked it down there on the corner of the Y of the mesh. And then I brought it over the top with another loop and that's a bungee just to keep it tight. So this is super mobile. It's super lightweight. I have a lot of these that are nine feet long, I think, eight, eight feet long. And I can pick them up by grabbing the top. The plastic is just loose enough that I can grab the wire and I just pick it up and like toss it off to the side to get it out of the way. But what happens if it's gonna bluster and blow? You know those rocks that you find absolutely everywhere when you're digging? Um, I find some that are as big as I can get that will still fit in one of those remesh squares. And I put it at the ground level in a corner remesh square so that it's sitting on the wire. So you probably can't see me, but it would be like in this square right here, sitting on the wire. And I put one at each corner and I thought, well, probably I need more. It's probably this winter it's gonna blow away, but it didn't, they don't blow away. So you can put more rocks if you feel you know, less confident. So um, you can also, this is quite high. So I'd like grow eggplants under this size, but you can also squash them a little flatter. So see, this is about 18 inches high and it's wider. So there's a four foot bed 
and my strawberries are under there and there's deer netting on here because in winter I can't use my motion activated sprinkler that I was talking up last time um, because it'll freeze, right? The water hose will freeze. So there's deer, this is not bird netting because that's a little hard to control, but the deer netting is easier to make sure that it stays on and doesn't get tangled up. And on the end, this end is open. I didn't have a problem with it, but you see there's a, there's a stick here. This is another, another hole, one of them. You could put either a piece of rebar or a stick across the end and anchor it to the edges, the bottom edge of the tunnel and then tie the netting to it. And then it would be like a definite stop for the squirrels. Here's another version, this is higher. These are favas that are in the front yard right now. So the rabbits and deer really like to eat them. So this is again, deer netting over a tall tunnel, but follow my cursor, favas grow up and get pretty tall, especially in my six hours of sun. And then they flop over and they're hard to find the beans and it's kind of a mess. So I'm gonna hold them up. So I actually have another tunnel so see my cursor here and there's more remesh that goes like this. So it's a low one with no netting and they've grown up through it. And then I have a high one to protect it. So it sounds like a lot of faff because I suppose it is when you first make them, but it's a lot easier than, you know, building a mini greenhouse or trying to work with bird netting that the plants grow through. And so I just make these once and then I just reuse them for years and years. I have some that are 20 years old and they're fine. And I can cut them down and use them for different things. When I'm not using them for a hoop house, I can flatten it out and grow plants up it. So they're very adaptive and I quite like them. I would say this, if you have plastic over them and it's a sunny day, it can get sweaty in there. So you wanna vent the ends by pulling the ends up or the sides up a little bit. And I just walk out and take them off um, for midday if, I, if it's really sunny. Um, I'll just go out for my 11 o'clock stretch and take them off. And then I go up for my four o'clock stretch and put them back on. Not on all of them, but if, I, if I'm particularly concerned about something like getting too hot or too sweaty. And they make good trellises too. So remesh, this is rebar, which is concrete reinforcing rod. You can get them really long. And they've made a hoop, they've made a big tall tunnel. And then see these, these are tomatoes. So these trellises are made of remesh, not hog panel again. And you can trellis tomatoes. I'll talk about that in June. Um, I think it's June. Anyway, you can trellis them. And then they have, you know, um, they're not as dense. The foliage isn't as dense because you prune out some of the foliage and they um, have better airflow and they're up off the ground and they're not um, catching quite so much humidity. So that, that's something that some people like to do. I like to do it. Who has some questions or comments? Does anybody have anything you wanna say? I got nothing. Okay. Bill had a question in there. Oh. Excuse me. Peter had a question in there. Oh, okay. John, can you tell me what it is? I don't see it. Uh, will you share these close sides with your constructions? With my, oh, like with my instructions? Um, I definitely, oh, the slides. Well, the slides are in the recording, but I suppose I could, I could think about how to do that. I could just slide that, share the slide deck. Yeah, I mean, John, I could probably put that somewhere, right? I tell you what, if you want them, why don't you, um, 
there's a feedback form at the end. If you could make a comment that you'd like to see one or all of the slides, then I think I could probably share them. I have to think about it. Um, but yeah, of course, we want to be able to do that. Okay. Well, uh, and you have put have... your email and you put your email content in the in Yeah, the I chat. did put my email in the chat. Yeah, email me. Yeah, is that good? Okay. Thank you, Peter. Oh, with the bungee cords. Sure. Yeah, I definitely, yeah, I can just send that to you. Sure. Okay. Okay. Well, here's where to get it. Now, all of this that's on the slide is in the resource page. And thanks to John, about to be in the chat as well. But um, you used to be able to get remesh that was eight by nine feet approximately. And that made the really long tunnels. Um, but now you can get it four by eight for 10 bucks each at Builders First in Bainbridge Island and Kingston. This is what I know of. So Builders First is used to be called ProBuild and I'm sure you'll tell me what it used to be called before that, because I don't know, but everybody has a different name for it. It's the one behind Virginia Mason on Wintergreen that's across from ACE. Or you could get a seven foot eight by 20 foot one for 50 bucks, which comes out to about the same at Addison Pacific Supply in Bremerton. So I suppose if you wanted to make a super tall thing, I think it's actually 20 feet only makes like a six foot high tunnel. But anyway, a really big tunnel like that trellis with the rebar that made a, a tunnel, um, you could do that. The question is, how do you get that home? But I think you could go to Addison Pacific Supply with an idea of how big you wanted your finished pieces and bring some bolt cutters. And if you don't have bolt cutters, I have small bolt cutters and you can borrow them uh, and cut it down and then put it on top of your truck. So um, any, yeah, let me email me if you wanna borrow my bolt cutters cause you wanna cut something down. Cause this remesh does cut with the bolt cutters. If you, I like a tunnel that is um, eight feet long. I'm gonna go back. I'm going to just click back in an awkward way. Yeah, okay. Actually, I'll use this one. This dimension right here is eight feet. So we're getting a four by eight foot panel. We're going to use a eight feet for this, and then it's only four feet long. So if you want an eight foot long one that's like this, we're gonna get two four by eight panels and wire them together, you know, just every once in a while, just put some really tight wire and um, then you'll have your eight foot long one. You could make an infinitely long one, but I think it's a bit awkward. And um, if you did it the other way, if you did it the four foot way so that the four foot dimension were here, you get a really tiny tunnel. It's like 30 by 30 inches wide and 15 inches high, I think. Um, so you could use that, but a lot of plants, you think they're not gonna get that tall, but they get really tall. So that's the eight foot dimension right there. And now I'm just gonna click forward. If you don't like it, shield your eyes. Okay. So what about the plastic? Don't love using more plastic. So um, I have used a lot of reused mattress bags and um, pallet covers. And um, when there was an appliance store here, I went and asked the guy if I could look for plastic. And he was so excited because he really didn't like all the trash they were producing. So that's a reuse idea. I think those last two years, if you use reused plastic, if you're going to buy plastic, you can get, you can buy plastic just like sheets in the, in the hardware store, but they aren't UV resistant. And then we're making new plastic and it's not re UV resistant, so it's gonna decay. So if you are gonna buy it because you just you know can't find anything, or a lot of times the mattress bag people, they just rip them down the middle. So I actually have to say, what if I brought you cookies? Would you, you know, cut it cleanly and give me a big piece? You can, um, I'm actually gonna stick with the reuse thing for a sec. You can, you don't have to have one big piece that goes over it. You can use like two smaller pieces to cover it up and just put the paracord in more than one spot to hold the plastic up. If you're gonna buy it, 
you can buy at the hardware store and it probably lasts two years. I'm guessing you can buy a UV resistant roll. It's at Johnny's Seeds. Let's go there. There it is. Tough night light, tough light nursery clear. They're out of it right now, but I called them. They're going to get it for sure at the end of March. So they say, and it's a hundred feet long. So if you got that, it's $51 for a hundred feet. If you got that, you could somehow let everybody here know, or like we could probably organize it somehow. If you wanted to share with six other people, then every, we'd get six closures out of that, right? I think six, eight foot tunnels because everybody could get like a 15 foot piece. And then they say for sure this lasts four years. I think it's gonna last longer. I got some because I, I found it at a garage sale. So I felt like that was a score. So that's how I learned about this. So am I conflicted about promoting the plastic? Yes, but those are some options. And then, yeah. So, and I use it absolutely every season. I'm always using them. And I really like the metal rather than, I really like the metal because it lasts an incredibly long time and when it decays, it just becomes iron in the soil. So what are we looking at? Do you need to use greenhouse plastic? Regular visqueen. Oh, it's not UV blocking, it's UV resistant. So, the plastic doesn't break down in the sun as easily you know it'll particulate in the sun eventually it gets weaker and stuff so that's why the uv resistant roll is available but certainly you could use um regular plastic you could just buy new regular plastic and i was saying i thought it lasted a couple of years in my experience i think it usually does last a couple of years but maybe if you're careful you could get it to last longer Okay. Carol, I use, is... I use regular six mil plastic that's just left over from other projects to do some of my yes. composting. And mm -hmm. two years, it's not full sun all the time, but two years is the absolute extent that it has lasted me. Then it starts breaking up into tiny little pieces that I have to chase all over my yard. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it's great to reuse, but you're not going to get as much life out of it, right? To reuse from people's trash is good. Well, that is everything about cloches. And I'm going to show you what, just remind you of what the classes are projected to be about this year. So next year, predators and pollinators and spring crops. I have a specific question on the feedback form about whether you want me to talk more about how to put seeds in the ground and make the carrots come up or how to make the lettuce sprout evenly or something like that. So you can tell me if you would like that and I will adjust things according to what you want. Because um, I don't know if you're at the level of wanting to do things that you're gonna grow in winter time and that's a little more challenging or you, you just wanna make the carrots come out of the ground. So what you want, so that is what you can, you can do. Oh, John, the feedback survey form is in red at the bottom of the text part of the um, of the resource page. Okay. Final questions. Let's check. Oh, okay. Fran wants to know more about what needs to be started from seeds and what's okay to buy starts. I think tons of things are okay to buy from starts. Um, see. I don't remember where I was in this. Um, yeah, I buy some starts. I mean, I think it's fine to blow it by everything um, from starts, except for these guys right here. I don't think you'll find them as starts. They do sometimes have garlic in pots, but garlic is so easy to just stick in the ground that I don't think we usually need to do garlic in pots. But um, these are the ones that we do directly in the ground because they have a diving root. And we can't have them start to circle inside of a pot or get malformed in the pot, in the little tiny pot, because um, it's 
you end up with carrots that are split and things like that. So, you know, you meet people who every once in a while who manage to start a parsnip in a, in a tube out of a, this one did, woman did it in a tube out of a, a paper towel roll and she started all of her parsnips in these super long tubes. Um, let's see. So you can buy all sorts of things in as starts. I think you could buy everything here as starts. You can get peas as starts and beans and all of these things as starts. And it's just, if you were saying, well, do I need to make myself create these as starts? They're pretty easy to sow directly. So I probably wouldn't do that. But if you wanna go buy them, then I think so. Is any, can anybody catch me on that and say, nope, you need, to, you need to just never do these or always do these? I don't see anybody doing that. How was that, friend? Does that give you the answer that you want? Yes, thank you. That's very clear. Okay, cool. I think I have a modified version of this actual page in the resource page, which is good. I, mean, I, had, I had another question that you skipped. Oh, okay. What was, oh, can you say it? Yes. So for heat loving plants, mm -hmm. you know, like tomato, is it good to put some bricks at the base to heat up during the day and stay warm longer in the night? Um, oops. Um, if you do that, you are preventing the soil from heating. Does that make sense? Oh, I see. You mean the brick is heating, but the soil is not. Yeah, so sometimes people will put bricks on plants around plants that don't like heat, mm. like supposedly oh. <laughs> clematis. Oh. <laughs> and then I've seen other, um, an experiment where they took 50 gallon barrels and they put them all over in a greenhouse because they thought that would heat the greenhouse, right? That would at least maintain the, the temperatures. But they found that the barrels were shading the ground and it cooled the soil temps. Right. So I think I'd rather have the, the tomatoes have happy roots. Okay, thank um, maybe you. if we, uh, does anybody else have an opinion about that? But you could use a cloche, but you know, for a while anyway, and then get them used to not having that. Do you know some people make super tall high tunnels? I may try this ridiculous thing this year. I may suspend one of my hoops really high over my tomato plants. Even Lange Lovejoy has written about making you know, tomato houses. Because I'm at the point where I can do ridiculous things. <laughs> I just yeah. listened to a podcast by uh, um, Seattle Urban Farm, and they talked about high hoop, high hoop houses versus low sort of stuff. It's, it's very interesting, uh -huh. a lot of good information. I'll, I'll put the yeah. link into the uh, chat. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, so those are even, a high hoop is like almost like a greenhouse. It's like 20, can be 20 feet wide. So it's like a massive version of a, of a little low hoop. And a tomato house is a narrow thing. It's just like four feet wide and, and maybe eight feet tall. What was I gonna do? Do you wanna see the resource page or are we over that? Anybody opinion? It's gonna make you queasy because I'm gonna, scroll through. So if you haven't seen this, it's got everything from the last class. Here's the planting calendar. I'm not going to take you through the whole thing, but it's got all kinds of books and all the things we talked about today, but then go way down and it has locally adapted seed sources, seeds from ancestral cultures, and uh, the everything I know about local pea patches. So that's actually on two pages. So there you go. Crop rotation. You're right. I have not talked about crop rotation. I was going to do that in the pests and disease one. It depends. Tomatoes, I think, are at least three years. Some people rotate. Uh, some people rotate seven for some crops. So potato and tomato are a minimum of three years. And there are these things called rotation groups. So if you grow things in the 
potato family, which is all these things, and say you're growing them in this bed, you should grow them in that bed the following year, that bed the next year, and then rotate them around. I'll say that rotation does not usually work perfectly, but, um, but we give it a try. We try hard, right? Can I put my handwritten list of veggies by season? Yes, but I'm not sure what that is. Let me find it. Was it one that I actually talked about or is it one that I was... Let me see what I have. These are like, are you talking about this thing? Oh wait, I'm not sharing, Never mind. Showing the right thing. You're not talking about this, right? Oops, I got a N Y E S. Was that yes? Do it again, Jerry. Yes. Oh, this. Oh, okay. This is this is what we eat in the winter. This was so. I'm going to show this later, but this is fresh in the garden, and some of it is under those hoop houses. And then we have things I sell her in the garage and dry and ferment and freeze and all that stuff. So did you have a, sorry, I'm not used to this trackpad. Um, did you have a particular question about this, Jerry? That's not very big, is it? Should I try to zoom? I don't think I can't. Won't let me go in any bigger. Anyway, that was for a tour that I did, but I was just, this, these are not actually the slides that it were for this presentation. So they're like extras. But anyway, you can have these things. If you have the space to start them in the fall, um, then you can have these fresh in your garden and you can save a lot of things and that kind of thing. Okay, is that okay, Jerry, you got it? Okay. Oh, that's sweet, thank you. Okay, um, so in the chat has been placed the, the link for the um, feedback form, right, John? No. Oh, we didn't see that? Yeah, it's, it's um, the one that says forms. John to everyone. John, could you place that feedback form one more time, please? Yep, it should be at the bottom of chat right now. If you scroll all the way down, it should Thank be you, there. Thank you, John. Thanks. Does anybody have anything that you'd like to say? Any ideal or contradiction? Like, I never do this, Carol. I think that was baloney. Come on. It's a club. It's called Veg Club. I can tell you that copper has never worked for us. We uh, did wow. two raised beds in our garden uh, two years in a row. One time mm -hmm. we tried copper tape, um, completely covered the edges of the ra raised bed. And then uh, that didn't work. And we had a bed that was right beside it that didn't have it. And then the next year we put copper pipe on around there and that didn't work either. And so we oh. were thinking that maybe they were already in the soil. <laughs> oh yeah. They were, they were in the soil. So we trapped some in there probably. Yeah, yeah, but it, it'd be interesting to have some, I don't know, a little local research. Yeah, but there so are people the, who love it. Oh, yeah. The, the, the survey looks like it's one from last time. Err, I gave the wrong one. Okay, I'll do it. Isn't that? I'm sorry, um, John. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'm about mm -hmm. to put it in the chat, I think. Okay, don't do those surveys. I guess I made a mistake. Okay, I'm gonna call it the March survey and it's about to be put in the right place. Okay, nope, I've done it wrong. Thank you for your patience. That's the one. Okay. 
Meridel, tell me if that's the right one. This should be the right one. It looks like it. Uh -huh. Does it look good? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing the survey. I really appreciate it, especially the part where you say, this will be helpful, this will not. Here's what else I'd like to know for the future so that I can make it right. Because I kind of have to take a guess as to who I'm talking to, you know, like what your needs are. So do you answer specifically in terms of yourself? Because, you know, like a lot of your uh, planting at home uh, advice is very useful, but I'm not going to use it because I don't plant under lights. Right, right. So well, I, I do want to. Yeah, well, that's the thing is I don't know who's here and I suspect I have, I mean, from last time I had people who are very experienced, but they're just really curious and they want to know more. So they want the lights. And then there are people, someone said, I just got a moved in new garden, never touched dirt before. <laughs> you know, so I want to know who I am talking to. And I guess I can't apply it to the next time, but at least, you know, I'll, I try to look for trends. So I would like to know for you in particular, what's useful, if that's okay. And if you have a better way to do a survey, because you're better at it, let me know because I want the good info. Well, thank you so much for coming and for sticking thank with you. it and all that. That's really cool. And I hope that I see you next time. Thank and you. Eventually, months from now, in person. Sorry. Okay, thanks a bunch. It was very nice. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, the recording everybody. for this the recording for this will be on Bainbridge Prepares YouTube channel probably about a week from now. Um, it's uh, uh, it's just how we do the handoff and and then they watch it and make sure that uh, um, it, it came across correctly and then it gets uploaded at that point. So give it about a week and it'll be up there. If you want to email me directly, I can send you, I'll put it up on my YouTube um, as well, but I'll have to send you the link for that. And I'm going to put my email in the chat right now. And thanks to John so much. And thanks to Bainbridge Prepares who sponsored this. And we will next time talk about preparedness a little bit, like just for a few minutes of why is, why are we doing this for preparedness? So, because they're the ones who funk it up. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone. Anything else? We got anything else? Okay, bye everybody. Let's see.